Good afternoon, my name's Kevin Graham and welcome to your Wednesday Bulletin. The Bulletin that has been asked on numerous occasions to test out face masks. Colin, how's sunny going up today? It's actually sunny. It's, it's nice of you to say that. It was um, worse earlier on, to put it nicely. But uh, yeah, the, the sun's out, the sky is blue, the grass is green and we know how the rest of the song goes. Definitely, Paddy Laverty comes in and says, Afternoon, Axon Wednesday crew, afternoon, Paddy, and all the viewers and listeners that are currently on with us or are listening and watching later on during, uh, during today before the big game tonight in Aberdeen. Before we go any further, as usual, I just want to say please like and sub subscribe this video. Uh, it does it does great things for the channel, actually, and our subscriber base is actually going up at a rapid rapid rate of knots so hopefully everybody's doing well tell your pals and tell people you didn't like either just please like and su subscribe like this video just now even though even if you didn't like it just like it thank you very much uh we've got plenty of topics to actually go through today Colin so the, the headlines about uh Leela Bada we're going to have a wee Aberdeen preview we're going to be taking the, the the viewers questions for those lucky enough to be joining us live and I think we'll start with the not the 10 o'clock news section where we just have a wee run through of things that are happening at Celtic Park I want to actually first thing first we'll start with a wee light light-hearted note Pitbull oh brilliant Josip Juranovic are we going to get the chance to actually see Mr. Worldwide at Celtic Park doing the halftime draw? It's going to be interesting to see if Mr. 305 will become Mr. G42 and make his way to, to Celtic Park. Um, I mean, the last time we had someone sort of of that calibre at Celtic Park doing the halftime draw, you're talking when Coolio done it, and that's probably that, one for the, the older generation, that. That, that, um, was one, that was one of the best halftime entertainments ever. <laughs> That was that, that 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 takes a lot to be beaten. That actually bet the, the the girl who used to be on I think she's still in Emmerdale from Kirk and Tullock. She used to be in Take the High Road Natalie someday. She came on at half time once to sing a to sing a song that she was releasing. And yep. it was utterly terrible. Yep. Uh, and there's one for everybody that's listening. Who's the most famous person you remember doing a half time draw? Get that in the chat whilst Kevin rambles on about Natalie Robb. Natalie Robb, there you go. State of mind comes and tells me it's Natalie Robb. I think she is in Emmerdale now, not that, I, not, not that I watch Emmerdale, but I'm sure she's in Emmerdale. Stephen Coolio isn't on Pitbull's level and never was. I think, it, I think that depends on your age, mate. I think that really does depend on your age. Um, aye, it's, it's, fanta it's fantastic that uh, Pitbull's actually picked up a song that I first heard last week on the way home from the Rangers game and I couldn't get it out my head for days, weeks, and the hours, hours. It could, just, every so often I just feel, feel myself singing Josip Juranovic for no apparent reason on Zoom calls and team meetings and stuff like that. It's, a, it's actually, it's a big earworm, ain't it? I, I mean, I've, um, that, that song came out, what, 2015, 2016? Um, and for anybody that's been to sort of somewhere like um, Turkey or one of the holiday kind of party destinations, you know, at night time when you're passing all the, the clubs and that, you'll, you'll definitely hear about a pit bull coming out of the, the pub. So um, I've got to say Fireball was definitely one of pit bull's better songs. Uh, up there would give me everything and um, a couple others. Kev's going through his notebook here like that. I've probably never heard of some of these. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's great and it's catchy. That's We, we had this discussion um, with Anthony Haggerty a couple of weeks ago in the chat. And we we're talking about the Jota um, chant as well. The Jota one being to the, the tune of a, a kind of early 2000s classic from the Baltic area. Um, the Numa, the Numa, also, Numa song. Yeah, the it Numa is. Numa or Dragon S Detai or whatever it's called. Um, by Ozone. By Ozone. And I was saying that's up there with Chant of the Year and Kevin and uh, Tony was saying he could have sat and wrote a better one in five minutes. It's not about the quality of the song, it's about the catchiness of it. You're saying that you're sitting singing it in team calls, people sitting singing it. Friday night, if you go past a Celtic pub, you'll see people strolling out just shouting, Joseph, you <laughs> know, it's just the way it goes. It's, there's a catchiness to it. Um, and definitely this year, I've got to admit, 
the fans not being in the stadium last year, as painful as it was, you can see them bouncing back in style uh, because the, the, the chants that have came out this season have been second to none. Uh, and the fact that someone like Pitbull, who you think maybe was massive five, six years ago, he's still sitting there in the Billboard Top 100 with about seven different songs because he just features on everything. Um, sharing that, if you were to get him to Parkhead, I'm telling you, it would be an absolute classic. It would be, it would, it would be up there with one of the strangest things ever. Like the time that the two characters from Disney came to actually promote the Descendants. I remember that, yeah. yeah. And nobody in the stadium knew who they were, unless you had daughters under ten. And I knew exactly who it was <laughs> Dove Cameron. I knew exactly who yep. the two two people were. I went, oh, can them. So, do you remember when we went to play Copenhagen a couple of years ago? And all the boys and girls that were lucky to go over to Copenhagen brought back um, Tsunami and they played it before the second leg. Yes. Stuff like that. It's just a, it's, it's better under the um, the Paradise uh, Light Show to have stuff like that instead of the sort of generic sort of studio music, as it sounds, if they're playing. Well, well, so, last, well last Wednesday, sorry, Colin, last Wednesday they went back to roll with it at the final whistle. Yep. And Roll With It was brung back from Paris in 1995. That was the first time that the Celtic support had sung that. So as you say, these things carry on um, from European adventures. Yeah, and you take a look at some of the, the best chants that have come out of the, the sort of Celtic fan base. There's either been classics from the 1980s and 90s, like I Want to Be Edouard. That was a, a very, very simple one to go on. But even things like Toy Town, um, I'm trying to think, uh, disco land, things like that is all came from the sort of scene that the people have grown up with. You grew up with the likes of the, the Roses, the guys that are going to the games now and that are starting the chance, they grew up with the likes of the sort of DJ Hickeys and the, the Pitbulls. So this is what we're experiencing now and I've got to admit, it's, it's great. It definitely brings uh, a bit of energy to the crowd and uh, you could see Joseph Juranovic was very, very delighted when he walked past the fans when he was warming up on Sunday. Um, he was loving it. Pitbull's loving it, we're loving it, Celtic's loving it. It's good for us, a wee bit of attention uh, drawn to us in a positive light for a change. Definitely. F F Finn Fogel comes in. W WTF has Pitbull honestly stopped listening to new music in 1982. And Tony Cassidy comes in to actually tell us, Hiya, Tony, hope you're okay. He's only got 25.1 million followers on his social medias. We've oh. actually, I mean, that's, that's on. on Unbelievable. I mean, we may as well speak about the fans in, in, in this section. Eh, when you're talking about the, the, the corner that brings the atmosphere to the stadium. It was announced yesterday that the, the, the lower section of the North Curve, which is the Green Brigade section, will be closed for the Rafe Rovers game eh, as a punishment. I'm going to use the Neil Lennon air quotes there. Uh, a, a punishment for the absolutely phenomenal display that they had before the Rangers game eh, last Wednesday night. Uh, everybody in this section has ever, has been offered a full refund or a relocation. And what I want to say, Colin, is I, I've seen some a lot of hysterical takes on this with them trying to lay the blame at the club, trying to, for them to try and kill the feel-good factor within the club over the last couple of weeks, where the health and safety hoops that Celtic had to jump through to actually get the standing section up and running was five years in the making. And we all know that there's guys in Glasgow City Council and, and uh, staff like Polis would love to shut that section down. And unfortunately, whether you like it or not, pyrotechnics or pyros are illegal in Scotland and within, within the stadium. And the display, no matter how phenomenal it was, does put the safety certificate at risk. In saying that, though, Celtic's punishment for the one game closing is akin to saying to your pet dog, didn't eat any of my sausage supper, than sharing it with him anyway. It's not really a punishment, it's a wee slap on the wrists. But to, for people to actually say the club are trying to kill the feel good factor in this situation, I feel as well, why did the mark? And I love putting a boot into the board too, but I think in this situation, it's why did the mark? It's almost a tick in the box exercise, Kevin, isn't it? Um, it is, it's just a, a sort of, look, 
we're going to get into trouble for this. We don't want to give you into trouble for this. This is the best way that we've found in a, a scenario to work around it. I think the North Curve would rather Celtic stood up against it um, and actually backed them because I still think that the North Curve thinks that the, the club doesn't necessarily back them to that extent. Um, and I'm not speaking for any of them. It's just my opinion, the way I, I see it coming across and what I've read on social media. I, I do think that there is a there is a movement towards the use of pyrotechnics in Scottish football, and it has to be a safe move. Um, things like cold pyro. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen that, Kev. Uh, that's the te- the run a test with that in Scandinavia, is it? Yeah. Is it they, do it in, they do it in the MLS as well. Right. Um, where basically the, the you see the flame come out, you can run your hand across it, it won't burn you at all, there's no heat is emanated from it um, and could potentially do the exact same thing as what we saw um, on uh, last Wednesday night against that mob um, and could bring the same sort of atmosphere. It was a great entrance to the stadium. Um, everybody, I, I mean, even the ones that were sort of always like to put the foot in. I never heard a single person complain about that display last Wednesday night. I don't know about yourself. No, I never heard anybody complain. I'm right above it, eh? And, and like, I couldn't see nothing for about 30 seconds, but I never complained. It, it, no. it made, when you actually saw, it was actually the glow from the flares, like, lighting up underneath the stadium roof. It was utterly phenomenal. It was an utter, it was utterly phenomenal. I loved it. And with you, I think, I think we need to actually look forward to here and, like, bring in stuff like cold py- pyro, as Gary Oliver can find, mm-hmm. cold, cold pyro not, in, not involved. It's just not the Celtic support that used pyrotechnics in a... Uh, uh, in football now, it's a thing in Scottish football, and I think the Scottish football authorities have got to start looking at safe ways of bringing in this atmosphere. Absolutely, and as you say, when it comes to probably the big two in Scotland, that's when there starts to be complaints about it. I've seen it at umpteen grounds around the country um, following Celtic this year, and there only ever seems to be a complaint or a fine when it comes from Celtic or Rangers. And I don't know if it's just because the use of it probably is more and it's more focal because these these games tend to be on TV as much. Um, but I, th- I think you're right. There has to be a way forward to um, actually changing the approach towards this. Everybody says, what's the best atmosphere when you go abroad in Europe? They talk about Galatasaray, Fenerbahce, when the, 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 the stadium's lit up Everybody seems to, it's as if you get a ticket and you get a pyro to go with it. That's when you, you go in. You don't get a pie and bovro, you get a ticket and a pyro. And that's mm-hmm. how you get into the grounds. And everybody goes on about, oh, I'd love to experience that atmosphere there or uh, Boca Juniors River Plate and stuff like that. There, there has to be a way to do this in a safe manner going forward. And even, the, and Peter Campbell asked a good question here as well, Ke- uh, Kevin, it's about the, the cold pyro would it solve the problems caused by the smoke? It would, because there's no smoke emanating from it. And I think that is more to the problem. I don't think it's as much a fire hazard to the club, but it's the sort of the smoke inhalation and et cetera. Um, to me, there has to be a consultation probably in the summer, led by the fans groups of ones across um, Scotland that want to participate with the boards or an executive of the boards um, and look at it because there's a there's a certain element of fans that want it, there's a certain element of fans that don't want it, there has to be a compromise found in there somewhere. There has to be a com- compromise found. There, there, are, there is things all over Europe. When you, were, you, when you were talking about the cold pyro, it, it takes me back to a conversation that I had during lockdown with a, an interview I'd done with the two Fire Nord SLOs who were at Celtic Park. And they they take that they take the fire or ultras on health and safety courses on how to use the pyrotechnics. So if there's any like problems or that, these guys know how to like defuse the situation and stuff like that. If you look, I think in the MLS, there's no like organized pyro yeah. and folks score the goals and stuff like yeah. that. We can't we can't take the spontaneity away from you. I'm, I'm not into this. Oh, there's somebody where a yellow coat comes out and lights a lights a flare in the front. Then like they write, I'll have to write a safety report about it. But there is a way that Scottish football has to has to go forward uh, with. 
the, the change the change in fan behaviour, especially the young younger fans' behaviour, Colin. That it's Scottish football has to get on board with it. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, I think uh, the guys like the the boys section and, and and Motherwell, and I think Hibs have got a wee section in that now. Eh? It is getting it is getting yeah. more. And, I think most teams do. I've, uh, I've seen St Mirren have got their own section. Um, Hearts have always had a sort of that section to the the right hand side of the goal as well. Um, so th- there is an you'd rather the, the ultra fan base be spoken about in terms of displays and stuff like that as opposed to the sort of fake fighting that you see outside of the grounds. You'd or rather... The, you, or you, or you, on the pitch against Motherwell against St Mern. Well, that as well. You, you would rather that than talking about the sort of ugly, fake Green Street side of things. Definitely, and there was a there was a I actually caught a radio program on Five Live yesterday afternoon where they were talking about the increase in football hooliganism in England since fans have been allowed back into the stadium. It was extremely one sided, right enough, and it was mainly down of that a uh, rotund uh, Leicester fan going onto the park and hitting the Nottingham Forest players during the FA Cup tie, and the Leicester fans filming themselves trying to hit put a uh, Tables and chairs through Witherspoon's windies and not in them on, on a Sunday on a Sunday afternoon. Eh? That, that's fair, complete... If you try and do that to Witherspoon's and not in them, you're probably making the place look better. <laughs> probably, <laughs> about, probably. Sorry for anybody if you're not in them. It's listening <laughs> there. But, but, uh, let, let's let's say uh, have a look. Peter comes in and says smoke bombs, no flames are allowed in Australia. Uh, Robert Highland, cold pyro, cold pyro, and scalding hot bovril. Aye, there, 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 is a, there is a bit of a difference there. Uh, well, let's have a wee look again. I'm, I'm going to bring in that one the now. Peter Campbell, the, the Green Brigade can feign surprise or disappointment all they like, but they have been told over and over that Pyro is illegal. What more can the club do? And this is where we are with this. I think the Green Brigade, if if, if you had been on, if the Green Brigade would be honest with themselves, they probably knew that they were going to get hit with a ban with us. Oh, when, when, when they're doing it, when they're setting this up, they know that they're going to get hit with a band with us because mm-hmm. that's the way that that's that's the way these these things up, uh, these things work. Uh, Paul Byrne can't back them if they're br- breaking the law. Well, it, it's the law. It's a law I, I probably don't agree with. I think there's a lot of work as me and Colin are, are on the same boat here. I think the club and the Scottish football, Scottish football, have got to look in general how to improve atmosphere, and that is embracing safe pyros. Um, I'm going to ask you this: ridicules are robbing the fixture of its world famous rivalry of opposition fans is utter lunacy. I would have agreed with that comment before last Wednesday night. But I, I loved last Wednesday night, Colin, because there was not one bit of bitterness in the air, which sometimes can happen in these fixtures. What's your thoughts, what's your, what's your thoughts about this? I've seen a lot of debate on this. And first of all, I do apologise to the fans from Nottingham. I've seen a couple of them come into the <laughs> chat. So Joseph Kelly's just the first one that pops up here. So apologies for that. Um, but yeah, when you look at it, I was always, before the game on Wednesday night, I was always of the opinion that the 800 was just a token gesture. I thought that was stupid. Um, And if there was ever going to be a point where you had them back in the ground, um, then it was going to be the way it was before. The 8,000 at Celtic Park, the 8,000 at Ibrooks, whatever the, the sort of numbers roughly work out to be, because I did think it added something to the game. Now, as Celtic fans, and what you just said there, Kev, is is absolutely coming from green tinted glasses to the fact that you you see no bitterness, you see no sort of um I'm trying to think of the, 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 the right words to use here. There was no sort of reaction to, to what's been sung by both sets of fans. Now if you're a Rangers fan sitting in a, a pub or sitting at home listening to what Celtic fans sung on Wednesday night, then I'm sure to a man, every single one of them would have had a complaint about something. Now, I'm not saying they're right, I'm not saying we're wrong, I'm saying they have a complaint about something. We have a complaint about something. We hear them singing as well. To me, it comes down to the atmosphere and the, the sort of old firm, sorry, not old for him, Glasgow Derby. I don't want to get into any more trouble this afternoon. No, no, you can call it the old firm because our club have kept the old firm alive. Well, that's so, true. 
Um, when you, you you speak about that and you speak about the atmosphere of those games, it takes you back to going there and getting a result and being part of the minority. I remember being at Ibrox on Samara Sunday and actually silencing the crowd when he takes it down McGregor and puts it into the back of the net. Yeah, you put up with the, the 70, 80 minutes of absolute filth that you hear, but just actually putting them in their place is some feeling, it's some buzz. Watching them leave when you're three or four nothing up. I mean, I'm, I picture how many would have left it three nothing down at half time on Wednesday night. Things like that. I think this it's either going to be you look at going back to the way it was or doing what we had on Wednesday night. I think it takes a bit of a sting out of it. I do think it is a massive sort of advantage to the home side. It's, it's a difficult one. I, I grew up on seeing 8,000 there and people are saying, well, it's you've got sectarian, you've got racist shouting, singing. It's almost as if that game is part of that game. And it's not the right thing to say, but it is part of that game. And see when you go to Celtic Park, see when you go to Hamden and it's 50-50, that sometimes, although the atmosphere at Hamden is terrible, that can sometimes be some of the best moments as you see the, the crowds emptying after you've won the game and knowing that you were the victorious ones there. I under, understand where you are completely coming from there, uh, Colin. I mean, you're saying you, you grew up on these games where, where there have been 8,000 Rangers fans there. I started going to these games when there was 18,000 Rangers fans there, which is, which is a phenomenal figure when you actually think about it now. But as Brown Warrior comes in and tells us that their, pet, their pettiness has created this perfect storm, you reap what you sow. That's and, what it comes back down to, isn't it? And, and that, that's exactly what it is. They could not handle 7,500 Celtic fans having a part in the Brimlon. No. They could, they could not handle that. And those at the top of their staircase listened to the more fundamentalist element in their support and got us getting 800 tickets. For me... This will only change if Sky tell it to change. If you see it becomes too much of a massive advantage to the home to the home team, then Sky will tell it to change, and that's only way that's only way it will change in the future. In my opinion, I mean, I've got to admit, Wednesday night was a fantastic atmosphere. It was a fantastic atmosphere, and I definitely think that it did. It did add something to our side of the game. Did it take anything off of them? If it did, then that was a bonus, but we were always going to beat them on the park as well with the way that we played football. I I, I don't know. I, I am absolutely torn on this because it is the first time that we've been in this situation. I, I, I could maybe turn around to you in 18 months' time when we've had another couple of these and say, Do you know what, Kev, I was wrong. Mm -hmm. I, I want it to stay the way it is. But after that, it just something just wasn't quite right. Ah, well, I, I really, really enjoyed it, <laughs> and I didn't miss them one I little it. bit. I, 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 I didn't miss them one little bit. I just thought it was a great question. Uh, Will McMullen comes in and says the atmosphere was great without Ranger, without the Rangers fans. Uh, Aidan Mooney comes in. Ollie Muller's halftime draw, I recall. He was also on the same flight as me up to Glasgow that morning from Gatwick. <laughs> Uh, John Curry, how are you? I'm for Nottingham. Uh, to balance things up, Martin O'Neill's Celtic played Leicester in a, in a friendly game in, 2000, in 2001. And I must admit, it was one of the worst trips I've ever been on. And to balance things up, Nottingham, uh, sorry, Leicester was not very nice either. So... <laughs> So anybody for Leicester coming at me as well, eh? but to balance things up, Leicester wasn't a very nice place any, <laughs> either that day. Uh, right, European squad. In, Hatati, O'Reilly, Maeda, out, Shaw, Yuragiri and Soro. Uh, Gucci misses out altogether despite him being uh, back, back in training. No really surprises there apart from maybe Gucci, eh? I, I mean, there's always going to have to be one that misses out and with the way that the three that have already started and that are included, it, it would be very difficult to choose Gucci over one of the three of them. Um, Maeda, I thought, put in a very good shift on Sunday at, at Fur Park and scored a, an absolute Calton Cole of a goal. 
Um, he's he's one that you're looking at as a backup striker or a, a left winger. So he goes into the squad. O'Reilly looks as if we've managed to just take um, Tom Rogic, add a bit of pace and clone him. And he's came out English and he's been a fantastic signing. Uh, and Hatati, Hatati's the second coming for me. So there was no way that he wasn't getting into that uh, European squad. And the players that have missed out, Sorrow, I think there's still a good chance that he might leave the club. Some of the windows are still open to the end of this month. Uh, and the other two have already left on loan. So uh, it's uh, it's pretty common sense. It's one of those decisions where it'd be very hard to argue against it. It is, um, and Ange Postacoglu yesterday explained why uh, Kyogo and Turnbull were uh, Kyogo and Turnbull were in the squad as well. Eh? Uh, they, they won't, they've got no chance of, of playing against Bobo Glint next week. But Ange is gambling on us being in further rounds where they'll be able to actually give us a give us a dig out. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, that this Bobo Glint game's actually sneaked up on us. Eh? Uh, it seems so long, so, so far away in December when we qualified. I actually need to take a look at their squad because they, they, it did feel as if they were selling all their best players um, over that sort of end of season window, mm-hmm. including uh, one of their players went to Hibs, I believe, as well. Yes. Um, so I need to take a look and see who's still left in that squad, see what they've invested in. But, I mean, this is a perfect chance for us to be playing them. Um, they're still in pre-season. We are kind of on this bit of a run at the minute right now um, where we, we seem to be tearing teams apart. We just need that full, complete 90-minute performance and I don't think it's that far away. Uh, hopefully it'll be against Bodo Glimp and it's one of those ones where you can maybe put the game to bed after the first leg and you can give some guys a wee bit of a rest when we go over there. Hopefully. It was just a surprise to me when the Euro squad was named and I checked my bank and, and like people when people were going like that, uh, oh, by the way, the European money is coming out bank accounts left, right, yep. and centre. And I'm going, what is that? Is, is it? We're in February already, and the European, I mean, the European games are com- coming round. So again, that that was that was a that was a big surprise to me. I was wow, European game next week, but we've got a massive game the night called. What do you make? Uh, what do you make of the, the just sorry, just before we go into that? What do you make of the the price for the European game? Thirty pounds. Is it thirty quid? I think thirty quid's too high for the third tier competition and. In Europe, what were we for the the, the group stages there? So twenty four pounds, twenty eight pounds a ticket. I can't remember because I didn't go there. So, a oh, good point. Well, um, I think it was roughly somewhere between twenty four, twenty eight. Someone back me up in the chat. Um, it's that you're dropping down a competition. I don't know what the ticket sales are currently sitting at, but you just think that maybe if they dropped it down to twenty pounds, which is what you've been charged for Rafe Rovers um, next Sunday as well could could easily fill it out. I know that the tickets are now on general sale, so to me it doesn't sound as if every season ticket holder's picked up their option. It, it, it doesn't sound like that, no. And, and again, it's it's a period just after Christmas. People are still trying to pick up on that. I just thought £30 is, is, is a bit expensive for the third coat. Uh, is a is a is a bit is a bit expensive for for the third third tier competition in Europe. Uh, I just do. I, the club the club will probably go will can probably give me figures to back up why they've gave it as that figure and that mm-hmm. that's fair play. But I think I would rather have sixty thousand at Celtic Park. Um, oh, absolutely, get, get, getting the team through that than some of them going, I can't, I can't afford to pay the 30 quid to go to that. And if you're taking your son or your daughter, then that's £49. Then you've got everything on top of that for a midweek game. That's uh, it's quite a lot of money, I think, in this day and age, with everything else that's actually happening in, in the world at this precise moment in time. Yeah, and that's, that's as we're saying, that's for season ticket holders. You go to um, non-season ticket holders, you're talking an extra tenner on top of that as well. So it's a lot of money. Um, especially with the two games coming up very soon. And as we say, Celtic have picked a squad with the hope of advancing even further in this competition. So maybe a wee bit of kind of giving back to the, the fans would have been good to see. But as you say, there'll, there'll probably be a reason for why the, the price is set at that level. Definitely. Sean Lee comes in to agree with me. I'm from Leicester and I agree for you. It's a dump. <laughs> there we go. Aberdeen tonight, Colin. 
and you're talking about the next game against Bo- the game against the game against Rafe Rovers is on the TV. The game against Bobo Glunt is on the TV. The game tonight is not on the TV as Sky Sports have decided not to take up an option for this game and actually show some English Championship games. This is just another. This is just another case of the Sky deal being really, really poor for Scottish football, ain't it? Kev, if you give me an hour, I would give you a whole rant on it. I I done some research this morning, and the the figures are absolutely frightening. I'll try and give a kind of brief overview of this whole situation. So, the TV deal runs to the end of the twenty four twenty five season, and it's worth thirty million pounds for the SPFL. As part of that, they get to show forty eight games a season plus the playoffs. So you're talking about the playoffs of the, all of the leagues included within that, not just the championship. So it works out that you could get anything up to maybe 60 games a season. Last year, they only showed 41 of the 48, and that was including the playoff final between Dundee and Kilmarnock. So already they're underselling the Scottish game. Now, when you look at the attendance figures of um, how many people watch a game on Sky, then you're looking at somewhere in the region of, and this is taken from the SPFL accounts, 510,000 people on average watch a Scottish Premiership football game. Now you compare that to what our second, sort of our closest rival would be in terms of European football, and it's the English Championship, where on average 700,000 people um, are supposed to have watched a game. But on average this season, it's dropped down as low as 276,000 and they get 120 million pounds a year four times what Scottish football gets to watch for example tonight on Sky Sports main event it is Preston versus Huddersfield on Sky Sports football it is Preston versus Huddersfield which ironically comes after an SPFL roundup that lasts the whole of 15 minutes and on Sky Sports arena which is usually set for your Raiders or my Giants, it's going to be Blackburn versus Forest. You're not telling me that tonight of all nights there wasn't a channel on Sky Sports that could have been set up for Celtic or Rangers game to be shown, considering how close the gap is in Scottish football, how much interest is in Scottish football right now, and instead of that we're turning to a sort of... (laughs) I don't even think Preston are anywhere towards the promotion or relegation places. And Blackburn sort of here and there, they've got some uh, big Chilean striker who, once he discovered he was Chilean, found the back of the net more often than when he was English. Mm-hmm. That, that That's what it comes down to. Uh, it is embarrassing how much we've undersold our game to them. See, uh, the, the highest ever watched SPFL game on Sky had one4 million viewers now if you take that as a basis to start a subscription service for Scottish football Kev you're saying that perhaps there's 1.4 million people across the UK that want to watch Scottish football probably more than that there could be double that and you charge £10 a month to cover every single game then you could easily be double triple quadrupling what our TV deal is and when this Sky TV deal ends, or if we don't, if we get to end it sooner than the 24-25 season, is the only way that we can get proper coverage of Scottish football and proper coverage of Celtic in Scotland because we have been sold under the bus with second-rate commentary teams, with third-rate pundits, and this is the third or fourth time this season when both teams have been playing head-to-head Games that would have been both been shown on Sky, uh, sorry, BT Sport, with proper commentary teams and proper pundits, and we have been sold short once again. It is pathetic this Sky TV deal, and if you could get a decent lawyer, you would find a way out of it. Definitely, Colin. I, I, I agree with every single word of that. Um, it's. There's been some comments in, in the comment box on if you didn't want to pay for Sky of ways to watch games, which I'm not going. I'm just, I'll just point you to the comments. I'm not going to. I'm not, I'm not going to mention any. I'm not going to mention any of them out. Loud. It's, it's all right, Kev. We've got some. I know some of the guys that run these places um, that are big fans of Axom. So keep up the work you're doing. And if anybody wants to know somebody, let me know after this. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Brian Walsh, PPV is the way to go for Scottish football. 13.99 tonight. Not bad for a decent product. Happy to pay this directly to SPFL clubs rather than Sky Sports, especially if it guarantees seeing games. I think some of the Celtic fans would actually say there, Brian, is this is the fourth time that we've had to pay clubs direct this season. I'm calling. Uh, I, I was saying to Brian, Oh, sorry, I thought you were calling me Brian. Brian's not here this week, Kev. Come on. <laughs> no, no, Brian was a commentator. I, say, say, I, th I think I was I was actually addressing I was actually addressing the commenter there. Eh? I, I've been taking Breaking the most, fourth wall. You broke uh, yes, the fourth wall, Kev, has it? Yes. I'm pushing things forward, mate. I'm taking this hosting <laughs> to the next generation. Uh, so that's why I would say a lot of Celtic fans would say, well, this is 1399 that I've already paid to St. Martin, Ross County. Um I think and another couple of teams, and it's something uh, it's something that Scottish football needs to actually have a look at. But I understand, understand that point uh, completely. MB comes in, whoever negotiated the Sky deal should be sacked. Well, it's probably Neil Doncaster uh, and Brown Warrior. BT had a great platform for Scottish football. They did it right, in my my opinion. I, I think uh, we're all missing BT, ain't we? Oh, desperately. And Kev, see those figures we were touching on there? That's just the UK. Mm -hmm. We're now at a, a point where we've got an Australian manager. We've got a Japanese dream team of players. We've got players that are connecting with uh, teams or, or have connections with teams all over the world. Cameron Carter Vickers with the American connection. Do you know in America, they've got the deal with CBS and Paramount Plus that shows 85 Scottish Premiership games a season. And it cost them a couple of hundred pounds. A, a couple of hundred thousand pounds. In total, the, the whole worldwide TV deal for the SPFL goes for £2.1 million pounds a year. And that's to over 150 countries worldwide. That is pathetic how much we are underselling it. Patrick Dillon comes in to say that he'll be watching it on BN Sports. BN Sports have paid less than 1% of what Sky have paid. And you can guarantee that the coverage will be 100 times better even if it is guys like Richard Keyes sitting in a studio talking about it. A lot, a, a lot of these cha cha channels you actually get, your B in sports, whatever, however way you get to watch these channels, it's usually the Sky commentary you get anyway. Exactly. So it's a Sky production you actually get. And these these guys just use it, just take it on their feeds. I found it funny last week when everybody was watching Daisa and Mieda if he was going to come on for Japan. That at half time there was an advert for Celtic against Motherwell. Exactly, that that is it. So if we're talking about there's one point four million people in the UK that want to watch Scottish football, how many more tens of thousands of millions even potentially across the world would pay a small subscription fee, Kev? to watch Dyson Maida, to watch Kyogo Furuhashi, to watch Cameron and Carter Vickers, to watch Ahmed Diallo, to watch uh, James Sands, to watch guys that are coming into Scottish football that come with that reputation. Scottish football is probably at the, the stage now where perhaps maybe just before Stephen Gerrard's departure, it's never been more lucrative for a marketer. It was a marketer's dream to go out there and sell Scottish football. And we sold it for £2 million worldwide. It's pathetic. Uh, it's pathetic. Uh, I'll just go through some of the comments here. Uh, it's quite... Martin Bicker, Celtic TV for me and Oz. I hope, hope you're doing well, Martin. Uh, Pat O comes in, backs up what you're saying, Colin. The Jap Japan market for selling Celtic games now is massive. Um, let's see. Shane Donovan... Because Sky not broadcast, we don't get it here in Australia. Here, but we can get every round of game live of other codes. Um, a lot of Australians now tuning in to Axel. Welcome to them all. Um, and Peter again. I'm only saying Peter because I can't. I didn't want to butcher your setting name, mate. Eh? So the future is the future is selling the rights to a streaming service where every match is shown live and be paid on demand. That is a system in Australia for the A-League. Amazon Prime are getting involved with the English Premier League football as well. They're, all, they're already involved in tennis. I'm sure they're involved in uh, loads of other sports as well. Yeah, golf and, and stuff like that as well. Yep. Something that is going to become more and more an option. Eh? Absolutely. And I know that uh, the zone or D-A-Z-N, however you pronounce it, 
they're currently in negotiations with BT Sport to take over their television rights because BT Sport have sort of went in hard on Sky Sports and sort of living to pay the punishment at the minute because they can't quite keep up. You've seen a lot of stuff that was previously on BT Sport making its way back to Sky or even going on to the likes of Premier. And I think actually when you look at it, pound for pound, Premier is probably one of the best subscription services that's out there. Pain in the backside to try and cancel it. But in terms of value for what you get for your £10 a month, there's a lot of good football out there. Um, Streaming is the way forward. It is absolutely the way forward. You take a look at all of these streaming services that are over here. I mean, a couple of years ago, you maybe only had Amazon Prime and Netflix. Now you're looking at Disney+. Plus. You're looking at um, some of the other ones that have just made their way over from America. Uh, you've got the zone, as I was just mentioning there. You've even got Peacock things and like Peacock and other other streaming services, it not. Um, yeah, not you've got Par- Paramount Plus that we mentioned as well, and um, there's there's so many of them out there. Even things like the League of Ireland. The League of Ireland last season put out a deal where basically it cost 120 euros for half of the season, and you could tune in and watch any of those games, any of them, because you couldn't get the fans into the stadium. That's a far better approach than what we did here in Scotland, where the, the prices ranged from £20 or £25 at Livingston for a pay-per-view to £9.99 for some games. And we, we can get into the debate, and I know there was a really good debate um, over the last couple of days on um, teams being sort of locking away fans out of grounds to give themselves a, a home advantage. But let's be honest here. I mean... The pay-per-view price compared to the price of a ticket, it just doesn't make any sense. If you if you're going to spend twenty five pounds, you want to get into the ground. Mm. If you're spending a tenner, there's a bit that there's something that you're like, okay, fair enough, I accept that. There has to be a way forward where there is, and I know there was one under Roger Mitchell, what about 15, 20 years ago, where we looked at doing an SPFL TV. A TV channel is not the way forward these days. No. An actual streaming service, service is. an app, that is what is the future of Scottish football. And it's about time that the guys at Hamden actually opened their, their eyes and saw what this was coming. Or go, or go, getting on board with a streaming service. You mentioned BT. BT's aim wasn't for you to sign up to watch Italian football, to watch Scottish football. It was to get your broadband. Yeah. It, was, it, wasn't to get, it wasn't to get viewing figures. Um, but these streaming services want you to pay. I mean, you just have a look at the Amazon Prime. If you sign up for Amazon Prime and you were getting all the Scottish games for $79.99, Amazon do not care if you're watching the Scottish football or not. They just want you to use it. They just want you to buy stuff that you didn't need for Amazon. Mm-hmm. They, they, so, but it's a selling food, point. That's all. Uh, it is a selling point. It's just a selling point, eh? So that, that, that is the future. But once again tonight, we're going to be struggling uh, in this country to find ways to watch this game legally. But, here, but here's the thing, Kevin. We'll, we'll go in and talk about the game in a second, right? Why isn't the game on TV tonight? There is red button options. There is a camera crew that's going to be there. There's a commentary team that's going to be there. What is stopping Sky from showing this game tonight? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. If anybody from Sky wants to come and a- wants wants to come and an- answer that, they uh, just put their put their thoughts in the comments. Uh, right, we we'll, we'll may as well talk about the game tonight. But I'll go through a couple of, of things first. Jay Davison talking about ticket price. He's spent over a hundred pounds for the next three home games. That, that that is a lot of money in, in today and for today. Uh, John Francis twenty five pound is a fair price for the conference. Underwater cabbage salesman twenty to twenty five pound. And David Kelly does actually make a good point. I think that I think he's right here about the group section price and over the last mm-hmm. four or five years, yeah. the club's pricing for European games has been excellent recently. As a comparison with Rangers prices, we pay far far less when in the same competition as direct comparison. Again, I've, I've, I'm, I'm not actually going to disagree with that. I, I think our pricing over the last four or five years has been brilliant until it's came to the knockouts. Yeah. Then, then the prices have took a massive, massive hike. Chris Walski, proud Aussie sell here. Ange is killing it. Colin, you can who else is killing it? The man who the tagline that we actually have, the incredible rise of Leo Abada. Now, Leo Abada's played 38 games for us this season. 
Uh, he scored 14 goals and had 11 assists. But for when they've returned for the winter breaks, he's, he's took it to another level. He has took it to another level. He's got four goals since the winter break. He's had three assists since the winter break. He's had one last-minute winner since the winter break. And he had one full-back meltdown since the, since the winter break as well. For me, he's going to be our young player of the year. Absolutely. And he's up there for player of the year as well, Kev. There's nothing stopping him getting both awards if he keeps going at the rate he's going. Um, 14 goals and 11 assists. I watched him coming out after he'd, I take it they, they had their shower and stuff because it was about 10, 15 minutes into the second half when both him and uh, who else came off at half time on Sunday? Um, Hattati. Hattati walked back to the bench because they had to come out from behind the stand, which is another ridiculous thing. Um, it was one thing that I, d- I didn't think that the mother will see you covered why we're still in that sort of red zone area with that, um, when every other team seems to have avoided it. Um, Abada looked absolutely devastated not to be playing that second half. And who can blame him? He had a goal and two assists. He was absolutely on fire. I can see why um, Anne just chosen to rest him for a, a, the, the game tonight and with the injury concerns that we had in the first half of the season, it is a case of putting a lot of these kind of star men into bubble wrap, but he's on absolute fire at the minute. And um, yeah, towards, I've seen some people saying a couple of weeks ago, there was people on here having a go at him. He's young and he's a winger and you're never going to get a, a consistent winger who's going to be absolutely outstanding week after week. So we know the potential that he's got to, and you kind of look at it and you go, right, we just want you to get to that. And for us, it's a bit of naivety because he is only, what, just turning 20 or just turned 20. When you've hit that kind of performance level as a Celtic player, a Celtic fan always sort of demands that of you, but you can't argue for much more this year. We we are a bit harsh at times as, as kind of fans because you do want the, the absolute best. You want a 50-goal season from a striker just like we'd had from Henrik, or you want a 30-assist season. For what he's done at his age, and this is his best season as a professional footballer so far, last year when he was at his Israeli team, he had 12 goals and four assists. Mm -hmm. He's just getting better and better and better, and it's almost a sort of, right, you've done that, go and do it again, go and do it again, go and do it again, and I I hope he does it again tonight, and he's got, he does have our full backing, we will say to players, you could do better, you couldn't do better. We've never kicked a professional football, but we're here as fans to give our viewpoint. Oh, I've never kicked a professional football either. But no, I have kicked a professional football. In 1985, I kicked a ball for the East Terrace and back onto the track <laughs> after, after somebody shot it. Uh, Ian McGonagall, he's quite right. Be fair, nearly everybody on Axon was criticising Abada a few weeks ago. Ian, we're not going to deny that. But I want to praise him now. Uh, I think he's the first. I think he's the first name on the team sheet tonight. Aye. When, when Angie's putting the, his team out tonight, it's the first game on the team sheet. And what I love is the contrast between him and Yotta. Mm-hmm. Yotta's like a playground player. He loves taking guys on. He's got the tricks. He's got the flicks. He, he's, he's got the looks. He like. He, he, he like. He, he likes how he likes the look. He's got the quick feet. He likes beating men. Abada is very, very simple and very direct. Mm-hmm. He will when you look at the number of finishes, it's a first time finish. He doesn't think about it. He's an assassin. He just goes, I'll make, I'm going to make this running behind you and I'm going to have one touch at this ball and it's going to be in the back of the net. He just does fit. He's direct and simple. And it's a great contrast to have him the two wings. It's a it's a great contrast to have him the two wings. And you you and a lot of things when since the winter break, we've all went, you say you're you're living in Rio Atati's world. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, and Abad has sort of been overshadowed by O'Reilly, uh, Atati, all the shiny new things that we've actually got. Yeah. But you look at his touch and his finish against Dundee United, <laughs> that was, I mean, to pull that ball down the way that he'd done and to finish the way that he'd done for a 20-year-old was phenomenal. Yep. You look at you, you look at the game, his finish, a game against, his finish against Rangers. Nobody's talking about that because we're, no. we're all ov- overwhelmed with Atati. But it's a great finish. It's a fantastic Absolutely. finish yep. on, on the volley. And and his goal on Sunday, on his goal on Sunday against Motherwell again, it's a first time finish with his supposed wrong foot. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's been phenomenal since we came back. He's actually been phenomenal this season. Apart from that, we dip. 
where we all went when we a lot of the players weren't play, played well. I can't think we could ask for anything else for Leo Abada. No, for me, he's on course to score 20 goals and give you 20 assists this season. Which, if you'd said that for any other 19, 20 year old that's actually coming through at Celtic right now, that would be completely unheard of. We'd be talking about the next 30, 40 million pound player to leave Celtic Park, or the first 30, 40 million pound player to leave Celtic Park, even. Um, it's it's no surprise that he's already getting um, attention from teams down south, the same way that we see uh, Juranovic is getting as well, although I wouldn't worry too much about that. I don't think the Rats get much longer left at Leicester, so uh, don't worry about that. A badder for me is just, as you say, something totally, totally different, because you look at the goals he scores and go back to the goal against Rangers, how he just ghosts in at the back post, puts Barisic down on his backside and puts it in with an outstanding first touch. His movement is second to none. I did not think he was getting that ball for Rodgick's second goal. I thought um, Ralston had massively overhit it because, obviously, if you've ever been to Fur Park, you'll know the slant that's on that pitch, the, the slope that's on it. And uh, if you're sitting behind the goal, it looks as if everything's out of bounds. Uh, it's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, he's, he, he didn't give up. He kept the ball in. Great c- cutback, first touch. Roger puts it away. As I said, there is kind of one person at the minute who, when you look at it, with the exception of Callum McGregor, who is your captain, is always going to be the first name on the team sheet. Leela Bad is the guy that's there. Definitely, David Kelly. I would I wouldn't have wanted that goal v Dundee United to have fallen to anyone else in the squad. The most composed player at the uh, at the club. I, I, I think he I think he's grown this season. And when you've seen since we've came back for the winter break, the amount of big big moments that he's now involved in shows how how much of an important player that he is. I says that he's the first name on the team sheet for me tonight. Up front, I think Yota is the other goes on the other side. Who goes through the middle, Colin? <coughs> I, I would go with Yakimakis. Um, I think he's been really, really powerful in the last um, couple of games. His, his hold-up play, his strength and positioning, um, I, I think he wouldn't be judged as much this season on his goal-scoring record, and I do think the goals will come. To me, he put a performance in like a, um, a, a Lyndon Dykes, that was the kind of performance level I was looking at. The Lyndon Dykes, when he first started playing for Scotland, got the odd goal here and there. Then he went on this sort of dry spell where he was getting involved, but he wasn't getting himself in front of goal. What he was doing was actually building up the, the rest of the players. That's why you see John McGinn getting hat-tricks and stuff like that. I think when you've got a game like tonight, you've got two centre-halves in McCrory and then David Bates, who are big sort of burly guys that are just going to throw themselves about the same way that McGabby was on um, Sunday. I think Jack Amakis is the, the, the right option to play there. He is leaving the space in behind for both Abada and whoever plays on the left, I would go with Jota, um, to get in behind. And it's leaving so much space in front of that 18-yard box for guys like Hatati, guys like Rogic to get the shot off on target. Look at the amount of space that was left for Hatati with the build-up play because the two centre sorry against Rangers because the two centre halves were so focused on the movement of Jack and Marcus because it caused them troubles beforehand when he'd got in at the front post at the back post it was all over them they were too focused on him that Hatati had so much room at the edge of the eighteen yard box that he could have picked his spot that's the sort of build-up play that he's got and his work rate to me has been fantastic since he came in and I think if he gets another goal or two then you might actually see him pick up and go on a bit of a run there is a player in there I just think that he's the the, the way he's playing the system right now doesn't necessarily mean he's the guy that you stick on for first goal scorer well, I think on, on Saturday, on, on Sunday against Motherwell, he actually gave the Motherwell back line a tough time but there was one moment in the second half which I, which I proved why I would go for Maida tonight. The, when Maida put that shot over the bar, when I think it was Yacht that crossed it, yeah. and uh, uh, he got he got in front of the defender. 
I says at the time, I says, you have a look. I says, Maida starts three yards behind the centre half there and still gets to the ball first. Yeah. Yakamakis has to be in the shadow of being offside to actually get onto that ball. Mm-hmm. But under un, understand what you actually say there. He, 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 he put in a great shift, uh, which is a pre wet so get for any Celtics striker and an Ange Postacoglu side, you have to put in a shift. Uh, and he, he loves he loves a physical tussle at times. He, he was he was running a bit like Wreck It Ralph. That's what that's <laughs> sometimes that's what he looks like up there. He just he, he just he just charges into people and he can hold the ball up and that. I just think Ange Postacoglu measures the striker on goals. And the fact that Maeda got his goal when he went through the mate in the middle might see Maeda get get a chance tonight. I, I I can understand the way that you're you're looking at it. Um, as I said, that was a, an absolute Calton Cole of a finish. Um, for anybody that remembers Calton Cole's goal up at Inverness, he did really get beyond um, the strikers. But I feel as if that came from the fact that they were absolutely knackered, Kev. See, when you look at it in the second half of that game on Sunday, we, we should have scored another three or four at the oh, very, was, very least, right? It was, it was brilliant. If Sunday was um, brilliant, I was, I was just shouting at the telly every five. Oh, just stop it. Just stop <laughs> doing this. This is too much for me to actually take in. But this, at one point, we broke on the counter and we had four on, I think it was four on three. And I'm going, this team's getting beat 3 0. How are we still managing to get four on three here? It was almost as if we'd just sort of. They we tired them out that much that it took so long for them to get back, and we just couldn't capitalise on it. Um, uh-huh. And I think at that point, if you've got Maeda to come off the bench, to be running in behind, you take a look at the game up at um, Petodje later on in the season. You had Adam Montgomery breaking down what was a very tired Aberdeen defence to get the ball across for Jota to score the winner. I do think that the legs will be taken out of them tonight because they'll be on the back foot, hopefully from the word go. It's the way Celtic's been playing. They come out and they throw everything in the kitchen sink at teams for the first 25 minutes and then according to other managers in the league, then that's when their teams take over and dominate. Yet to see that. Um, but that's when I think these teams start to tire because they're playing two and three games a week right now. And when you've got a bench that you can turn to, whether you've got maybe guys like Forrest, Maeda, um, guys with a bit of pace even I seen Johnston was back in uh, the, the squad the other day as well getting in behind that's where Maeda got a lot of his success in the second half in the first mm-hmm. half he just had to put in a very good shift going down that left hand side um, so I, I don't know for me if Maeda would be the one to kind of lead the line up there but uh, yeah <laughs> put it this way Aberdeen will not like to face either one of the two De- definitely. I must admit, I'm tired watching an Hans Poster Coglu Celt at the knack of me trying to keep up with him, never mind trying to chase trying to chase him. Jim Hannaway, uh, Jacka Marcus for him tonight. Uh, Jay Davison, Gio is a nightmare for defenders and very intimidating. Jack Am- MB, J- Jack Marcus is a great option for these type of games. And John C- Curie, Jack Marcus is benefiting from a run of games in the team. Snick comes in via Twitch. Uh, he's put in a few good shifts. Got unlucky. I feel a bit bad for Yaka Marcus, but I also wouldn't be, begrudge a my either that start. One well, again, what's good things, Colin? Eh? We've been on 57 minutes now, 58 minutes, mm. and we have them moaned that Kyogo's, Kyogo's missing. And we have them done for the last four games. That shows you how well whatever one of the front three are playing, that we're not missing the guy who was our star man by a long distance before December. You've got that and you've got who was our player and young player of the year last season and David Turnbull, who doesn't seem to have been missed at all since he came out of the squad. We still have a number of players to come back into this team and when you look at it, I saw the stats from Pai and Bovril this morning saying that over the course of the season Celtic have used 35 different players. Now, I'd imagine quite a few of them have now left the club. But I still think that we have a, a relatively compact squad of players that we can turn to. And you saw that sort of towards sort of November, December time when you looked at the bench and you're going, there's not really a lot of players that can come on and change this game here. But now that there's more and more coming back into it, I saw um, you and Murray complain at the weekend because you looked at the five subs that Celtic were able to bring on. That was a, a thing that was voted through by the league. That's the first time we've ever had five players that could have came on and changed the game. 
And as we keep going here, on the course for four trophies, because we are we're, we're pushing, well, I say four, we've already got one in the back pocket. We've got three trophies that we're going for here in the second half of the season. Having as many players as we can turn to as possible is a great thing. And when Kyogo, when Turnbull, when Dembele come back in, even when Julian, who'll probably start against Rafe Rovers, in my opinion, when these guys are available for selection, it pushes the guys that's playing to play to the top of their game because they know that if they don't play well, they're out and somebody else is in. And that's something we've not had at Celtic for a long, long time. We haven't had that for a long, long time. And, I, and it goes back to the Brendan Rodgers adage that basically... The, f- the finishing 11 is just as important as the starting 11 and that's the first time we've had that in about four or five seasons Colin Colin this has been absolutely amazing today that's the hour flew by already uh, we've covered quite a lot of subjects you got a prediction for the night there's a, there's a lot of confidence in the, there's a lot of confidence in the comments but Brian Walsh I'm going to bring this in I'm slightly concerned with some of the overconfidence I heard of this visit to Patojo and I talk in five or sixes is just complacency I expect a tough game as ever up there but before I make my prediction I went to the toilet at half time against Motherwell and a boy came in and shouted are we just going to beat every team 3 nothing at half time that's the sort of spirit of the Celtic fans at the minute and it's, it's a a good one to have. Um, Patoji, notoriously a tough place to go. Aberdeen will definitely up their game despite how poor they've been recently. I spoke about this with the Red Tinted Glasses boys. Um, check that one out as well. I'm going to go with 3 1 tonight. 3 1 Celtic tonight. I'm, I'm, I think we're going to have a victory, and I think it'll be a victory to nil. I think we might be quite comfortable. But again, I just hope we get the free flow in football that, that, exactly. we've been, that, that we've been blessed with over, over the last over the last seven days. And we've got the squad to do it now, which is something that we couldn't actually say in September, October, and November. Lads, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening later on. Uh, if, you, if you're listening on catch up, please. Uh, Paul will be back with back with a match day half an hour before for kick off, and just please subscribe and like the channel. We've got everything that you need in football, music, and culture, and just 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 subscribe and, and get on with us. I'm going to bring up one last comment before I go. Curtains are closing. Do Amazon sell cold pyro? Asking for a friend. I'm sure Amazon sell everything curtains. So thanks very much, everybody. 